And there's more to learn, you know. Anyway, no dilation. This is called a few words on the infinitistic perspective. Remember, we talked about infinity last night, right? How small is small, how big is big. And uh, in spite of the fact there are mathematicians in this room, I'm calling it the math mathematics of self-realization. OK, so when I came in the room, people, for some unknown reason, clapped their hands. And I said, if you're still clapping after I finish this, I'm OK. So look, when you deal with ultimates, uh, you can't trust your mind. That's the problem, but that's all we've got. That was uh, emphasized by Justin uh, you know, the other day, or maybe yesterday. You can't really predicate anything about absoluteness. It's almost a sin to do it, but you know, here we go. Um, we have to use what we've got. Now, I, I want to say further that everything I have to say is all about you. First of all, I want to get your attention, you know what I mean? It's all about you, <laughs> with a capital Y-O-U, and I can't help it because there's no one else in the room. I mean, you know, that's it. You're, this is all there is, is just you. Now, I know that sounds uh, a little bit solipsistic, but there is a kind of a, oh, there's a spiritual solipsism to which I adhere. You know what solipsism is? It's a philosophical term that says, hey, you're the only one in the universe. OK, well, that's it. So let's talk uh, a little in general about perception and how normal human perception distorts our apprehension of reality. By the way, I've got three types of reality going here. That's one of the reasons I've got uh, this up on the board there. There's uh, you know, reality with a little r. Then there's, whoop, you see, can't trust word does things. There's that kind of reality. There's this kind of reality. And there's this kind of reality. And they apply to three different dimensions. Uh, the first reality applies to everyday reality. The second reality applies to the um, reality within any cosmos. And the third reality is post uh, and pre-cosmos. In other words, there's no cosmos when this reality uh, is the only thing going. So. Uh, you know, maybe we can break into the spiritual triad a little bit, and all it may reveal, it's a game changer uh, for human consciousness. Our perception will change, and more importantly, uh, the self-perception will change. Um, the big issue, you know, it's, it sounds like uh, it's some kind of self-obsession, but it's really recognizing that there just is one self. That's all. And a lot of people don't even want to call it a self. Uh, but in the last analysis, you know, you go with Shankara, the other side of the Buddha, and there's only one self. So, and, and to talk about it is easy, and to realize it is just about the subtlest thing you can do. And it's worthwhile trying, and trying, and trying, and trying, because you've done it uh, infinitudinous times before, and you've succeeded. So you are a success story given the infinity of universes you've been in. Oh, excuse me, given the infinity of universes you've been. That's, uh, see, I, I, I really have to separate objectivity from that deep subjectivity. Objectivity is an illusion, and subjectivity uh, is where it's at. And uh, we are the, the eternal actor and the eternal reality and while it sounds like totally useless, as a background against our everyday practical activities, it's useful. Because it gives you the great paradox and it, uh, I don't know, gives you maybe a little bit of confidence, I would say. When in this, what do they, what do they call it? This, uh, oh, I don't know, they, they call human beings sweaty little bundles of something or other. And when you start to, start to think that, you know, maybe, maybe, the absolute is all there is and I'm it, you know, you get a different perspective. So given the limitations of the usual human perceiver, the very, very limited apparent magnitude of that perceiver, especially in large contexts, we're all just teeny weeny. I mean, uh, DK calls us microscopic man. The extreme tininess and partialness of that average perceiver, then I would say that perceptions of what we call time and space, just categories of consciousness as 
Kant would talk about them, a number of them. Categories of consciousness, uh, time and space are virtually unavoidable in terms of our perceptions, and certainly in the beginning, and it will be so forever cyclically. Although time and space seem paramount to human consciousness, in fact, <clears throat> they are unrealities, but necessary unrealities forever cyclically. So even a partial overcoming of these limitations would mean the taking of the third initiation for starters. And let us remember, remember that there are many other perceptual illusions that lie ahead. As a matter of fact, um, I want to insert a point here um, that partiality has no permanence. Partiality has no permanence. If you're anything less than absoluteness, you're, there is no permanence. And, and uh, that has implications for the sense of identity. So remember, too, then, that the universe, any universe, is a partiality. And, and no universe has any permanence whatsoever. OK. For man on the cosmic physical plane, which is just about all we can look at and then not even understand, because the masters are trying to understand it, illusion <clears throat> is not conquered until the ninth initiation. Maybe a th <laughs> first, the third, then the sixth, then the ninth. What are you going to do? You know, And then I will go a lot further than that, and I'll be more radical than that. And I will say, universal illusion uh, is never conquered until any universe breaks like an egg. And uh, there, therein lies, for the brave, the esoteric interpretation of Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> <laughs> the universal egg breaks, you know. And uh, when it does, uh, we are led into the post-universal uh, world where illusion does not prevail. Meanwhile, we have a nice time in the Mahamaya, which is the great illusion. So, OK, percepts, uh, usually understood as things that we perceive with our five normal five senses, are articulated in time and space. Now, if you're a magician and you're playing staccato, pop, 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 you know, you're articulating your notes. You're separating them one from another. It's not legato, you know. So they are articulated. Percepts are articulated in time and space. And they are apparently distinct in time and space, which uh, uh, perceptually are two forms of what we call philosophically in the old days extension. Space as a perceptual field of consciousness at any one time. Depends on how big the observer is and time being the sequential separation of perceptions due to the limitations of the perceiver. If you were the big perceiver and you were just perceiving yourself entirely, there would be no uh, time. So that kind of makes you wonder, what's the great breath anyway? Because it apparently is the big clock, you know? And how is it that it's allowed that there is time in regard to the great breath? So anyway, uh, we have a lot of limitations because we're so tiny. Right now, we, we are some kind of extension of the absolute, or let, I won't go that far. We're extensions of the universal logos, the one great God of this system. And not only are we extensions of it, we are it. But we uh, come down into self-chosen confinement due to limiting our perception. If we, if we saw the whole thing all the time, we wouldn't descend. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be emanations, but we don't. We are willing to partialize our self-perception until it gets tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier until we say, enough. And, and that prevents the universe from becoming in, uh, infinite. Now, some of you on the fifth ray, you know, you might get into this thing called the Pauli exclusion principle. I can't do that. You know, I was looking at it. And it is relevant, and it has to do with the superimposition of things uh, or percepts, maybe, in time and space. And he says, no, you can't really superimpose them. I'm not trained to do that. But I can work on the third ray a little bit here. From the non-scientific philosophical perspective, uh, normal human perceptions have what is called extension in space and duration in time. Normal human perceptions, extension in space, duration in time. We have that. And this is so because the perceiver is limited contained, that is contained within the field perceived, and thus lesser than the field perceived. I just mentioned that. Simultaneous perception of the entire fire. Didn't mean to say that. 
I meant to say field, but there it is. Simultaneous perception of the entire field is denied to such a perceiver for a while. One day you'll regain that. I don't know, do you like being a human being? It's okay for a while. Uh, it happens. And who knows what you were before, and nobody knows, really. Well, someone knows. Uh, something knows. Um, but we've forgotten all that. And um, we will regain it because you need infinite memory, which is a problem. I mean, there's so many problems. When you start to use the third ray, you can drive yourself crazy and everybody else, too. So uh, I, I'm, I'm trying. OK. Within the great Mahamaya, that which universal consciousness reveals, as it is uh, constrained in universe by the necessary finitude of all universes within a beginningless, endless series of universes. How's that for a parenthetical? It is hard to escape apparent reality, apparent reality of apparent extension and apparent duration. This is all the Mahamaya. Every universe is the Mahamaya. The only way to escape the Mahamaya is to get rid of the universe, which cyclically we seem to do. So, and anyway, again, I'm repeating myself. Time and space are the very substance of our customary understanding of the life process. But now let's ask ourselves some questions. Remember, this is about you, OK? I know it doesn't seem that way right now, but it seems like something so remote, so other, so out there, so what, you know? But, <laughs> but what if we can begin to penetrate the Mahamaya and understand that all variety, though apparently actual to consciousness for the human perceiver and for many other types of perceiver, that all variety is essentially unreal. Maybe it wouldn't be a very interesting world, huh? All variety is essentially unreal in terms of the absolute, or let us call it the absoluteness. What if, I'm asking you to kind of go with me in the imagination here, you know, because we think we're one thing. What, what did Einstein say about common sense? He had a different definition than the Tibetan, being the accumulation of all prejudices up to the age of 17 or something like that. I, I, something of that nature, you know. What if all sizes or magnitudes, you know, within any universe are utterly equivalent? Now, that's a radical statement, OK, as uh, what I call absolute infinitesimals. There are, you know, there's a kind of mathematics that's infinitesimal mathematics, and I have a friend and I consult with him, and he says, I didn't know you were interested in the infinitesimal. No, I'm interested in you, I said. Okay. So anyway, um, what if all sizes, all magnitudes of anything in the universe were just the same? And they were just absolute infinitesimals. What if you were an absolute infinitesimal? That is, and I'm going to try to define it here in non-mathematical terms, an indefinite, ever-reducible number which no than which no definite number can be smaller. I'm defining the absolute infinitesimal as that. An indefinite, ever-reducible number than which no definite number can be smaller. So uh, all magnitudes in cosmos would be essentially the same. Because comparing any magnitude, and here's Here's where we have to work it out. Because comparing any magnitude to absolute infinity always yields the same mobile indefinite magnitude, or what I call an ever lessening, without reaching zero, little zero, without an ever lessening. You get smaller and smaller and smaller until you're next to nothing. All of us in this universe are next to nothing. And then, when that illusion breaks, we become the no thing, as was demonstrated last night in uh, Justin's video. What if, what if I stop talking right now? OK, what if, <laughs> what if, essentially, and notice when I have a capital, I mean in the universe. When I have a little, little letters, I mean in everyday reality. And when I have big, everything caps, I mean beyond the universe, OK. What if essentially magnitude in universe is an illusion, albeit a necessary illusion in order to play the game of Mahamaya or the game of universal self-expression? What if? See, we're used to having size, bigger, smaller. I remember there was this wonderful book back from the 1950s. 
It was a photography book. It was called Family of Man. Have you ever run into that? Beautiful, right? And it showed this Tibetan monk like this, you know. And he said, to the wise, there is no great and small. That's when I pondered on that, you know, until I ran into it in a different way. What if all magnitudes are really the same size, and that size can be called an ultimate, though indefinite, negligibility? I like this idea of the ultimate negligibility. I like to make up words. That's, uh, you know, that's one of those things when you have the third ray, you love your own thoughts. It's a terrible thing. And you love to make up words, you know? And uh, <laughs> so neologisms is the territory of the third ray. I know I'm going to be scolded for this lecture later. OK. What if all magnitudes are really the same size, and that size can be called an ultimate, though indefinite, negligibility? Hi, you ultimate negligibility. What else are you going to find, you know? And that, and that all ultimate negligibilities are only one ultimate negligibility, and that goes poof when the, OK. Anyway, size doesn't make any difference. That's what I'm trying to say. OK. What if there are really, in reality, you know, that's the big, real, big reality, no relative magnitudes whatsoever, but only the great illusion, which is the universe itself? So then. What if all identities in the universe have no real magnitude whatsoever and are, when in universe, superimposed in such a way as to be identicalities? OK, you know, I like that word too. Superimposed in such a way as to be identicalities, no matter how different sub objects of differing size may seem to our normal perception, to the type of perception that I'm calling infuception, you know, that's a good word, infuception, the, well, the one pervading thing. You perceive it all the time. To the type of perception I call infuception, all such are separated by, uh, they're not, uh, not separated by any boundaries. Wait a second. They're not separated. All such are not separated. Oh, almost an error. Not separated by any boundaries and compressed into an ultimate negligibility which is always the same indefinite, ever lessening magnitude, no matter what universe we are occupying. Shall I go home now? OK. What if all magnitudes in universe are really boundaryless, absolute infinitesimals, or ultimate negligibilities? What if you are the smallest thing that can ever be, and even then you're an ever lessening and no definite quantity whatsoever? What, what about that? And the same for time and duration. What if time and duration are really uh, illusions, even with regard to the ultimate timekeeper, the ultimate cycle generator, the great breath, and that essentially there are no time intervals or measurable durations, and really never have been because in absoluteness there can be no divisions whatsoever. So there's a, that's a bunch of what ifs, what ifs, you know, and we can, you know, if we want to ponder on that, what if, what if. All this is, you know, just a, a play, a, a drama, a creation, a work of art, a self-expression. What if it's not real at all? And yet, of course, it has to be real because there's nothing else. So you get back to what Justin was dealing with last night of this man from the Netherlands to uh, paradox. Paradox all the time. You're running into it, and then you have to accept that paradox is maybe more real than logic. And that's hard when you're dealing with a, uh, a world in which uh, logic and reason are absolutely necessary. OK, so another way of saying this is that all apparent maha ma, ma, <laughs> ma, <laughs> maha myopically uh, derived times are really not only superimposed, maha ma, Ma oh, mama. OK. <laughs> Mahamayavically uh, derived times are really superimposed, but identical, and as potential, potentially negligible as possible without being zero. Zero in the sense of nothing, and not zero in the sense of no thing. Those are, to me, total counterpoised zeros. In other words, what if we can eliminate all interval? What happens to time? You know, in other words, compare 
compare eternal duration, beginninglessness and endlessness, to any interval, and it becomes temporarily an ultimate negligibility. It becomes just next to nothing. It, you know, so it just gets compressed, 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 and we discover there's never been any time ever. What about that? Now, in absoluteness, there can be no division. And people have been talking about, well, time is movement, yes. But without division, there is no movement. And without limited self-perception, there is no division. And uh, anything you can say about the absolute, like it has this, it has that, it's that, this, none of that is true. It's all an absolutely homogeneous essence, which is causeless, the cause of itself. It's not even the cause of itself. It just always was, ever was. So you can't really talk about absoluteness, though that didn't prevent me in my infinity book from doing 241 names for the nameless. I enjoyed that. And I figured, you know, like Justin said, we've got what we've got, you know. This is what we've got. And so until we got something better, we have to use it. Okay. So this is like saying, this is like saying that the universe never arose. Okay, this is like saying that no time has ever elapsed, whether measuring the duration of a cosmos or measuring the duration of a post-cosmic, pre-cosmic interval. In other words, there's an interval too, you know, the great breath inhales. Well, what if all those intervals are totally compressed, they're not even real? There's just no time. What if the absolute is all there ever really is at all, except for a problem that the universe does arise, apparently. So this way of thinking throws us back into absoluteness, from which there is no possibility of altered or mutated essence. We talk about mutations, but there is a way that we can get there. And I have nine minutes to do it. OK. What if no time has really elapsed forever because of the impossibility of really subdividing the absoluteness. Without division and its resultant multiplicity, there can be no time. So absolute, boundless, immutable, boundless, immutable principle. Any movement is a mutation. Any change is a mutation. It's just like, I call it the infinitessence, you know, coining a word again, the infinitessence. Um, subdivision arises this is important, from limited self-perception. Subdivision arises from limited self-perception, and for the absolute, even consciousness is a mutation. So we can't even call it the absolute consciousness. We can't do that. It is what it is, and only what it is. And uh, we want to, uh, what, what do you call it, predicate. We want to predicate all things about the absolute. It's got everything, in a way it does have everything, but not in an, an, an articulated manner. Not in any separate manner. It doesn't have a lot of things in it. It's just completely homogeneous. But something happens. I don't know how. Maybe next year I'll know how. I, I'll never know how. I don't think anybody knows how. The absoluteness, absoluteness remains what it is forever. Only one mysterious I don't even want to call it an action or an event, seems to recur with respect to this absoluteness which is forever. And that is the pre-cosmic arising and post-cosmic reabsorption of the one absolutely infinite, absolute deity. There is a deity, it's the actor, it's the actor. The actor arises. And that actor, when looking at itself, what does it see? On a good day, absolute infinity. That actor, when looking at itself, sees absolutely articulated infinity, not homogeneousness. That's left to the absolute, which doesn't even see itself. But this absolute deity, which is post-cosmic and pre-cosmic, sees, registers absolute infinity, then has to make a choice. And that choice is our universe. Okay. This actor, I, I don't like the word creator, this actor is the becomer, uh, and uh, all of us are nothing but the one becomer, who forever becomes all things, all self-perceivable. If you've got a thing, any kind of thing, whatever, it's a self-perceivable. 
Because where else do you get it? There's no place else to get it except yourself. So there is this super God that is unlimited and perceives itself and goes into action and then subsides later. Now let us regard space as usually conceived, not the absolute space of which HPB talks. What if no space has really ever existed? Though my Mahamayavically, and actually it has forever existed and will continue. So, um, well, gosh, I think I, um, okay, I think I hit a climax here, and I think uh, this is going to be a, what do you call it, uh, when something goes downhill. Anyway, <laughs> anticlimax. <laughs> I'm in need of the great breath. All right. So we have this boundless immutable principle, and I'm almost finished. Space, what is space in the normal sense? It is the illusory extent of limited self-perception. The limited self-perception of the, and that's wrong, universal, the UL, the universal logos. That's what space is. It's all psychological. My view of the universe is entirely psychological. I know a lot of fifth ray scientists, and this is out there, this happens, the big blast comes, two infinities collide, whatever. For me, it's all about me, it's all about you, it's all about us, it's all about it. So ultimately, and really, we are not large or small, great or definitely, ultimately minute. We are not definite quantities at all. Each one of us and each and everything is essentially, I want to have another word for it, what we are, a reducible indefinite. That's in, in, in the cosmos, okay, in the cosmos. A reducible indefinite, converging upon zero with a small z, but never in universe reaching it. Universal logoic will prevents any expression of the no thing from becoming absolutely nothing. When, when Spinoza uh, set out his uh, ethics, you know, he gives all these wonderful postulates, and then he, he was a wonderful philosopher, and D.K. said he was basically a member of the hierarchy. When he set out his, uh, his ethics, he said, uh, I reject uh, all of this is true except under the condition that there is no negation. He insisted there must be no negation. He had his own reasons, and I think I understand them. You can't eradicate uh, reality, and reality is the only substance that ever was and ever will be. So really, maybe I'm getting to the punchline here, okay? Really, we are all utterly the same. That's a pause for realization. All utterly the same. Though, in Mahamayavic spatial temporal illusion, we call a universe, we play the game of relativity which requires apparent interactive subdivision. So really, there is no relativity, except in the great Mahamaya, which is the universe, and that Mahamaya is the great universal illusion. Uh, the great fact is that each and every one of us is a non-divisibility, a reducible indefinite, who or which is essentially absolute infinitude and ultimately absoluteness itself. That paragraph itself, I think, you know, contains the whole thing. In fact, no matter how apparently small is a finite percept due to the indivisibility of the absolute, that percept is, now this is interesting, no matter how small a thing is, it is the entirety of the absolute itself. You just can't divide it. So no matter what you see, big or small, apparently, it is the entirety of the absolute. Everything is the entirety of the absoluteness. So how should we conceive of that? Well, that's, that's homework, OK? When reading about universal process, do not think that it is happening objectively. It is all deeply subjective infinitely subjective, and you are the actor and that which is acted upon. And cosmic history is your story. I mean, it's your story. 
Cosmic history is your story, my story. It is the story of the only being, and we are it. Cyclically forever, we will deal with the many and with necessarily less than absolute infinite, infinite self-perceptions. We will deal with limitation. Yes, we will. But while we are temporarily apparently fragmentary, let us not forget our true identity as the non-fragmentable, the essentially essentiality, which we immutably are. So, you know, well, back to spiritual solipsism, and you and I are the causeless cause. Now, is that going to inflate your ego? I hope not. It should reduce your ego to next to nothing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.